computer languages. Right. Learn computer languages, learn computer architecture, learn network architecture, learn how to be somebody who you would come to and say, we have the need for a computer system in our company, design the system, all the components, well, how are they all going to work, how's everybody going to get access, how's the cabling, what cable, how's all that stuff work, and give it to you as a request for proposal. And, you know, that laid all out, you know, in what would be a professional sense of you hand the person back a eight-page pamphlet detailing the servers they need, the data storage they need, the power sources they're going to need, you know, all the, the environmental conditions they'll need for the computer lab, because you can't just stick them in a hot room, you know. All of that kind of thinking. And it just seemed really natural to me. I took to it real easy and aced all the classes except for the programming languages. They sucked. But there were two aspects, <coughs> excuse me, there were two aspects to data processing thought at the time. <coughs> one was computer science, and one was data processing. Computer science was knowing how to take a computer apart and put it back together again. And I knew the basics of computers, I know what the components are, but that was more the math and engineering side of computer science, and I was never good at, that good at math. So I didn't like computer science very much at all. But the data processing part of running a computer, I didn't have any problem with at all. I wasn't real thrilled about programming, writing the code for programs. I mean, writing code to produce some sort of report that will give somebody information based on the data that's put in. And I was like, this is dull, dull work. Because if it doesn't work, I mean, they blame you. You wrote the code and the trouble of finding code after you've written seven, eight hundred, nine hundred, fifteen hundred lines of code and the program didn't work and you got to go back through it all and figure out where you made a syntax error in the code. But I learned, you know, you had to take a course in each language that lasted, you know, a semester. So I got four or five programming languages under my belt and then the data processing of learning the designs and all that stuff. And got out of there with a two-year associates in applied science degree in data processing in 85. Bought my van, went on vacation, took a year off. But the whole plan by Voc Rehab was to continue and to go on into a bachelor's in business administration with a background in computer and data processing because every field at the time needed computer science. Everybody was converting, even the business world, even the business management world had to learn new how the new technology and how the new information was going to be processed and made usable to a company for profit. So. I started the next year after taking 85. I graduated in the spring of 85 and I didn't go back to school until the fall of 86. And that's when I started going to the University of Missouri St. Louis and working on the bachelor's degree in business administration. And did that for a semester and started into my second semester and got into the microeconomics and the macroeconomics and the statistics courses and realized that if I followed this career path, I was going to be some little drone in an office somewhere. And I went, no. 
don't lock me up in a building all day. I can't do it. So I switched majors, which is common for anybody. But the easiest major to switch to that didn't require, you know, a great shift in curricular that I already had was psychology. So I just started working on a psychology degree. And I found the research part of psychology interesting. The experimental, the in the lab type stuff with the rats and, you know, all that kind of neat whatever behavior, behavioral psychology. And one day we were told we had to go do a report and we were told we were going to have to go to the library and use the computer system to access this vast database of psychological journals. And, you know, we were to pick a topic and then find supporting material, but we had to do it using this computer. And at the time when you went to the library and you use this computer, there was a librarian who did all the typing. You weren't allowed to touch the thing and you would give her key, you know, search words and she would come back with results. And all these results did was say, you'll find this journal article in this journal on this shelf and and then you'd go with your little paper slip out into the library and find all these journal articles and you know make photocopies of them take them home read them highlight them and then write your reports and stuff but sitting there that day watching her work that computer I thought that was the neatest thing since sliced bread because I'd missed them for so many years yeah. using them yeah. and it's Suddenly I thought, computers and what they were doing, what they could do with information, it just blew me away. Yeah. All the possibilities. And I finished my degree in psychology, but even finishing my degree and halfway through it, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do. Because I only had several options. When you go, if you get a degree in psychology, you either have to keep on going and get the master's and the PhD to become a psychologist or a psychiatrist, whichever. And even then, you're in a private practice or you're working for a company as an occupational psychologist. And I thought, well, this sounds really dull, too. So what am I going to do? Listen to other people's problems and figure them out all day? I think i got enough problems of my own. I suppose... The degree really helped me understand myself and people better and interacting with them better because my brain works at a higher IQ level. I have a lot of trouble communicating with people on the same wavelength because it's hard for me to tone mine down and that's why I stay in my own mind a lot. And I'm not saying that I'm surrounded by stupid people. I just, I always found it difficult in social situations to find small talk. I was never good at small talk. I couldn't just talk for the sake of talking. But I could answer questions. You know, you could fire questions at me all day and I'd talk and give you answers. But chit-chat, you know, I was never good at. So I never developed that social network that people that like to talk and chit-chat do. Mm -hmm. So, that degree was interesting. I lived on my own at the time. Um, I had moved out of my house because the commute from, when I was living in Crestwood and I had my house and I was going to the community college, I was only doing a drive of about six miles, seven miles from my house. But then when I had to start going to the University of Missouri-St. Louis in North St. Louis, then it became a 45-minute drive one way up to the campus. Park, do a transfer, get in an electric chair, run around campus all day, drive back home. And it always corresponded with morning, bumper-to-bumper, -bumper, you know, traffic-type stuff. I did that for 
at least a year or two and I said I can't keep driving and I was starting to lose equity in the home over bills owed so I decided to give the house up settle bills move into an apartment that was a few blocks from campus in North St. Louis it happened to be under the runway of Lambert International Airport which was interesting but I was a lot closer to campus and that made finishing that degree a lot easier but I lived in an apartment by myself and my husky it was just us of course I had a girlfriend of course I had friends you know people coming over and there was always a network of some support I was never when I say I was on my own I was never on my own there was always somebody not necessarily physically around because I did live alone but I was always having friends over or my girlfriend would be over at the time or other friends in the complex would stop by so finished that bachelor's degree went through the ceremonies and said what am I going to do with a bachelor's in psychology considering I don't want to be a psychologist and when I got to that point vocational rehabilitation said okay you're done because we had never put into their little plan from the very beginning that I would go on and get a graduate degree they um, wouldn't authorize my going on to a graduate school the only reason I went into library science was because of that librarian that worked that computer mm. she was a beautiful woman of course and she was very intelligent and her name was Genevieve and I love that name um, and I felt very comfortable in libraries because they were very quiet and I was used to being quiet um, and I always loved books so I was always surrounded I mean a library to me from early childhood was you know just this wonderful place to be so I thought if I can if I like libraries it's just a fly it's not mosquitoes if I like libraries as much as I do and libraries are starting to automate themselves and need computers right. then let's get a master's degree in library science but do you know why I chose library science I mean all this other stuff sounds like I was thinking and making goals but do you really want to know why I chose library science it's the only graduate degree that didn't require the GRE test the graduate record exam whatever it is you know to go to college it didn't require it all it required was the Miller analogies test which was more like a psych profile thing and I scored off the chart on that thing that was easy I can do analogies I did the Miller analogies test and aced it but I never you know you hear horror stories about the GRE test or that whatever SAT or whatever it was that you had to do to go to college and prove that right that thing the masters in library science was the only degree offered that you didn't have to take that other test and I didn't want to take it call me lazy but that's how I ended up in library school or pursuing the library degree once in library school you had to start with old school library thought you had to get the history you had to learn the Dewey Decimal System you had to learn how old school did everything you had to learn bibliography indexing abstracts how to write an abstract um, you had to learn all that old school library but there was all this new stuff that nobody knew yet because it was still on the cutting edge all these computers 
CD-ROMs came out the year I started my library science degree. That was 1990 or 89 or something. And the library had just gotten a five CD carousel in the reference department of these little databases that fit on CDs that you could, you know, call up and search and they'd tell you where to go in the library to find certain articles to do your research. I was comfortable in libraries and got real comfortable with doing research, but I always wanted that, the toy. I always wanted the computer. So I started, they had, they had just initiated all these new courses that weren't LS whatever number the course was, which was library science. They were IS, whatever the number of the course was, for, you know, for the level. And IS was information science, mm -hmm. not library science. Mm -hmm. So I mixed the two of them. And it was a 36 degree or a 36 credit hour program. And I think of those 36 hours, I ended up getting 42. Yeah, I had more than I needed, but over 50% of those credits were all on the IS side of the degree. I took every information science class they offered. Every automated information, everything I could learn about the library, old school, and how it applied to the new technology. And I got out of school and I thought, I didn't plan this. But I have a background in data processing. I now have a bachelor's in psychology, which allows you to help deal with the public, interact with people, understand yourself better, understand them better. And now I've got this degree in library science, and it looks like I planned it all. And there was never a forethought from one end to the other. It's just how I ended up. And then I spent three years sending out letters and getting reject letters and finding out that it wasn't as easy to be a librarian as you wanted, especially when they found out you were in a wheelchair. Because a lot of the libraries at the time still weren't automated. They were still old school. So if you couldn't, you know, push a book cart around and reshell books and yeah so the only thing I focused on then was being a reference librarian because I knew how to do research and I knew how to use the databases to find what I needed so I became a reference librarian but I finally got a job Secretary of State's office at the Wolfner Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped as their first reference librarian. And that was in October of 1994. I lived in Columbia and this was, the state library was in Jefferson City, Missouri in the Secretary of State's office. So we were technically underneath the Secretary of State, underneath the state library, was the Wolfner Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. But we were like a third division down from the top level of that office. But it was a beautiful building, elevators, had a beautiful outdoor patio. Mm. And I remember interviewing with the two women, the head librarian and the assistant librarian for that library. They interviewed me for like two hours. It was the longest interview I'd ever sat through. And you know how they tell you to, to prep for interviews and have all this stuff to say? I always went in and just did them by the seat of my pants. You know, if they'd ask me a question, I'd do my best to answer it about myself or whatever. <laughs> I remember one question. They had grilled me, you know, about this and that and my education and all this stuff and how I would deal with this situation, how I'd deal with that situation. And it... You know, I answered and answered and answered, and I felt like I had, you know, just given them my whole life story. And they looked at each other and, you know, do you have any other questions? Do you have any other questions? And the head librarian turned around to me and she said, 
Now, Terry, she goes, what would you, what, tell us something that challenges you. What is, what is the big challenge for you? And I didn't even think or blink. I looked her straight in the eye and I said, saran wrap. And the two of them just busted a gut laughing. I said, saran wrap really pisses me off. Because I can't use my finger. And I started explaining why. They got it as soon as I said it. You ever see a quad try and play with saran wrap? It's not pretty. Anyway, she gave me a job. I worked there for four and a half years. Of course, if I want to back up a little, in the summer of 93, we had a horrid spring in Missouri. Rains. All the rivers were flooding. You know, you see it happen on the news, you know, every once in a while, but 93 was a bad year in Missouri for floods. And Columbia and Jefferson City are right on the Missouri River or near it. And I had a lot of friends who lived right on the river, literally. You walked out their front door and the Missouri River was right there and all around them was country, woods, you know. And these were little bitty towns and stuff outside of Columbia. When the river flooded, I went down to get a friend of mine who was being, you know, rescued by people in a flatboat getting because even her house up on eight foot stilts was underwater. That's how high the river had come up. And the river is normally six or eight feet below the bank. So it came up over the bank and then it came up another ten feet and the water was all the way back to the road that came down this hill to get to where this group of homes was. It was all underwater. Anyway, I was there with my van waiting for this one woman to get her belongings out and I met this other girl that I had met once before and her and I got to talking. She was a younger girl. She was only 20. I was 33 and um, we got to talking and it was a real easy conversation and she had such a beautiful smile. She had these gorgeous blue eyes, blonde hair. Mm. But when we got talking, done talking, you know, and I was, it was a little awkward because I, you know, I didn't really know this person. She said, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, sure. She goes, can I hug you? Mm. And I went, well, yeah, I, I guess so. And that's something that you lose and don't realize you lose mm. when you're in a wheelchair is physical contact mm. because you're always surrounded by this barrier mm. that people won't cross. Mm. But she leaned down and gave me this big hug and kissed me on the cheek and she said, you are so sweet. And I was like, you know, nobody had said anything to me like that in years. I was like, oh gosh. Well, thanks. I didn't think anything of it. I mean, I thought about it, you know, and it was nice and everything, and a neat compliment. Anytime a guy gets a compliment from a girl, you know, it's nice. But about a week later, I was out on my porch watering my plants, and her and a friend of hers drove up in front of the house, and she got out and said hi, and I was like, hi. I was like, how'd you find me? And um, what I didn't realize was that she was a dental assistant in the office where I went to see my dentist. But she always worked on the other side, so I never really saw her. You know, there's two sets of halls of rooms, and hers was always the side I never went to because my wheelchair didn't fit down that way. So she looked up my file, found my address, <laughs> because that's where she had first seen me and found my address and came over. I guess she was a stalker, if you want to call her that. <laughs> Which I thought at first was a little weird, but I got over it pretty quick because it was a cute girl who was interested in me. Within a matter of a week, I think we had spent 18 hours a day talking and talking and talking. 
and she would go home to sleep and shower and, and come back if she didn't have work the next day or she'd go to work and as soon as she got off work she'd come over to my place and you know I'd cook dinner or whatever for her and six weeks later I asked her to marry me and she said yes and so we started thinking you know about a wedding and the logistics of her family being in Columbia, Missouri and my family all being in St. Louis which isn't a great distance, it's only, you know, 125 miles or so, but still. And of course, her parents, staunch Republicans, the last thing they wanted when their daughter brought home a 13-year-older a man than her, who was a quadriplegic, in a wheelchair, on welfare, no prospects of a job, had nothing but a big file folder of reject letters. The only thing that was my saving grace was that I had an education, and to them that was important. But they did not approve of the relationship. And you can understand why. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't want my daughter dating someone like me. Of course, as soon as I called my mother in St. Louis and told her that I had met a girl and that I had fallen in love with her and she realized how strong my emotions were, first thing she said was, I'll be down tomorrow. And when Stephanie came over that night, I said, my mom's coming down to check you out. I said, be prepared. I'm sorry. Because that's what it sounded like when she said, I'll be down tomorrow. I said, we're having dinner tomorrow with um, my mom and her boyfriend at the time because they weren't married. Yeah. So mom drove down from St. Louis the next day and checked out Stephanie. And when she left, she went, okay. I was like, I didn't need your approval, but thanks. So it got to be more and more, you know how relationships develop. It got to be more and more of a hassle of her to go home and, you know, change clothes and come back and, or whatever that she finally just, we moved in together. This little, my little one room or half of my, my half duplex with one bedroom, a living room, a kitchen and a bathroom. And that was it. But she moved in with me out of her apartment, which her parents were paying for. And um, it was around, it was after our first Christmas that we started to talk more and more about wedding plans. And we were getting flack from parents because everybody wants something different, right? And I didn't really want, I had given up on the church, so I didn't want a church ceremony. So she knew, you know, that there were, and I told her, you know, I can't see myself in front of a, a priest in my, because I didn't have a wheelchair that raised up at the time. I said, I can't see myself sitting down in my little wheelchair holding this girl's hand in a wedding dress, you know. I said, it just, the picture doesn't work for me. And uh, she said, one day she came to me and she said, I don't want to wait. She goes, let's just elope. And this was like on a Sunday. And we called the circuit court in Jefferson City. And they had an opening on Tuesday, February 4th. So we drove down without telling anybody and got, our, got married. And came home and told her mom. <laughs> told her mom. And told our, you know, we told our parents. Of course, they couldn't do anything about it at the time. So instead of printing up wedding announcements, we printed up elopement announcements. We've eloped. You know, this is our new life. If you want to send a gift, great. If not, be happy for us. 
and mailed them out to all the relatives like you would wedding invitations. And we stayed in that apartment until Stephanie finally said, this is just nuts. This is too small for, you know, she had a cat. I had a cat. I had my husky. Suddenly two people, two cats and a dog inside the rooms instead of just one person and a dog. So we started looking at houses. Of course, my credit's worthless. I don't have a job. I have no income. I think at the time, my social security disability was paying me $460 a month. And I got like $110 or $120 in food stamps to get through the month. And I had to live on six or $700 in the mid 80s. That wasn't easy to do. I mean, that's what forces people like me into the low rent, low income, unsafer neighborhoods as opposed to, you know, someplace that you would feel more comfortable, I guess, less threatened. Not that there's anything wrong with these neighborhoods, but everybody has a preference on where they live. Um, so we started looking at houses, and we found this house that was in deplorable condition. And because it was in deplorable condition, it was a rental. There's so many rentals in a college town. And the owner of this particular rental was wanting to sell it and evict the people that were living in it. And because we were first time home buyers, and because when I added my income to Stephanie's income, which was a lot better because she was working as a dental assistant, making, I don't know, ten, eleven dollars an hour or whatever it was, nine dollars an hour is still good money. Um, it was way more than minimum wage. She actually qualified for a loan for enough by herself with me as a, a co-signer with my little bit of income added on. And uh, there was a first-time home buyer program that we registered for and that paid all of our closing costs and you know helped out with about twelve or fifteen hundred dollars of what it would take to get into this home. And then, um, you know, we borrowed enough to buy the house and make the repairs that were going to be made to make it livable. And then what was funny was, this is October time frame of 90, got married in 94, October of 94. I got the interview call about a week before the paper signing to go down to Jeff City and interview at Wolfner Library. They called me on the Friday that we closed the house and asked me to report to work on Monday. On the same day that we signed the papers on the house. And suddenly I went from a dead weight as far as her parents were concerned, to a, a white collar professional librarian who suddenly had a salary of $30,000. It was weird how things would just fall into place. It was really weird that it all happened on the same day. And so I worked at the public library and I learned, I, not, it wasn't a public library, it was a private library. Every state has a library for the blind and physically handicapped. And what we mostly dealt with was sending out tapes on, books on tape and the recorders to play them. It's all through the government um, library system that runs all of these things, these programs in each state. I learned a lot of technology there that I didn't know before. I had to learn how people who can't see use computers because I was the reference librarian and personal computers were starting to become popular at the time. Matter of fact, I bought my first one in 1993. Um, uh, IBM Captiva or Aptiva or something like that. 
big 40 gig hard drive woohoo anyway I would get questions and calls okay I'm on my computer how do I and so I had to start learning how to use the keyboard because even if you're blind and you know how to type you know the keys and where they're at and what they had was screen readers so I basically had to learn to be a blind person and I would actually because I had a really nice private office on the second floor with a big cherry desk and everything the rest of the library was downstairs because it was mostly mailing and shipping stuff in and out I was the public office for the library for those patrons that actually did come in to visit us um, but I would actually be in my office with the door closed sometimes with those little blindfold things on that you sleep with and working a computer so I could better understand the people, my clients, that would call me and it was, it was a really neat time of learning and a whole way of thinking and working with them brought back that well you can't bitch about yourself, you could be blind look what these people are dealing with can you even imagine, and every time I would, you know put those blinders on and turn my chair and bang something or, you know hit the wrong count, just like God, how do people live like this? Everyone takes sight for granted. Everybody takes their body for granted until... So, that opened up a whole new understanding of a, cl a group or a class of people that, like everybody else, I just, you know, oh, they're blind, they got a white cane, and never give them a thought about how tough their lives must be and what they must go through. But I worked there for four and a half years. Um, while I was there, some days I had a lot of spare time. Do you want to just turn it off for the minute? This one? Yeah. The resume? Yeah. yeah. No. I had a lot of spare time and one of the things that the head librarian had always wanted was a website presence uh. and they asked me if I could do that and I said well I never studied HTML which is hypertext markup language I'd never studied the code as a programming language but I figured it was just code and you could learn it so I got a HTML for dummies book I told her sure I can do it and I went home and on the way home and bought an HTML for dummies and I said okay how do you do this stuff and I started writing code and I designed a website and I filled it with so much information and we put it up online and they were just floored by all because I had you know the history of the library um, new releases list and suddenly everybody that had a computer could reach us through the portal of the website all of a sudden there was a lot less mailings going out because you didn't have to send out the the new releases to everybody on the mailing list and when they called on the phone to talk to because there was like four different people down in the library that handled the alphabet and the patrons that were in the A to H section because people would call and request books and make a list and then you know if the books were available we'd ship them out to them if not it got put on the list and we maintained in our database that these people wanted these books and when you're blind I guess you read a lot or listen to books a lot so I mean the volume that these people went through was incredible I mean I, we had people that went through six and seven and, and sometimes 16 books in a week and I had a guy that used to bring in one of those postal plastic bin things full of these little green tape boxes every week and that was like 40 something books a week he would listen to and a lot of people were just doing nonfiction because that's where most of the uh, 
collection existed was in the non was in the fiction realm. So the nonfiction, they called me when they wanted to know something, the reference librarian part, and I would go out and use the state library's resources and all the books that are there in the reference department because my office was right next to the state library's reference department. So I had all the catalogs and books to look up and do research and history and that every, and I would get weird ones. I mean, they were fun. You'd get a call. My ancestors, I found their gravestone and these are the dates. Is there any way you can go to the archives downstairs because the Missouri archives were in the same building can, and look up on the microfiche and find any more information out about this. And I could, you know, I learned how to use the cemetery records and all that stuff from library school started paying off because I knew about all these resources. <coughs> and all the data processing and the hands-on with the computer started paying off because all of this stuff was automated now. So I worked with them for four and a half years. Salary went from the 29 or whatever I started up to about 33,000. And after a couple of years of working 40 hours, I, that was minimum. You had to put in your 40 hours. It was a full-time job. And I had to drive down there. And I had to get myself up at 5 in the morning and get dressed because it took a half an hour just to get dressed and get into my chair. You don't get into your chair and then go get clothes. You bring your clothes to bed with you the night before because you can only get dressed in a bed laying down, you know, for all the moving and rocking and what it takes to get dressed as a quad. Um, Stephanie and I started having difficulty with the marriage because of the limitations of the sexual aspects that have always go along with loss of body for a quad. And it just kept pushing us further and further apart. We kept trying to work around it and, you know, because we had both talked about all of this before we got married, about how hard it would be and the things we'd have to go through and the things she would face and the things I was incapable of doing. And my phrase at the time was, if you say yes, it's for the long haul. And you have to understand what the long haul means because she was only 20. And not that I thought I was worldly at 33, but she came and had a conversation with me one day about not being happy because she never wanted to spend her whole life in Missouri. And I had never wanted to spend my whole life in the Midwest either. That's why I ended up in Texas. That's why I ended up out in California. That's why I tried to go to Arizona to do, you know, different degrees and stuff. When I, um, actually, when I got done with my Bachelor of Psychology, just a psychology degree, I had, it takes 120 credits for a bachelor's, right? At the time, I had 165. All those extra classes, they weren't the business administration because most of that transferred over to the new degree. It was all composition, writing, poetry. And I had finally found something that I really liked again. So I started writing poetry, what I call bad poetry, submitting it to magazines for publications. And I only ever got published once in the Denver Quarterly. One of my poems got published. Um, I got published in a couple of local, you know, papers and stuff like that. You know, if a radio station had a contest, you know, write us a, a poem in X number of words or less for Mother's Day and win this prize for your mother, I always won them. I won one for my mom, I won one for my dad, but um, I actually applied to the University of Alabama's writing school and was accepted. 
but I couldn't fund it and the scholarship I wasn't eligible for. And since they weren't going to give me the scholarship, I was like, well, then I'm not coming. Mm -hmm. But that's where I wanted to go when I got done with the, I hadn't even thought about the library science. It was just in that six month period of finishing that bachelor's and figuring, okay, I got to find something to do that I was toying around with the idea of moving to Alabama, Tuskegee or wherever it is on the Tuskegee River, wherever that particular college was. And I wanted to be a writer. Not that I ever thought I'd be a good one, but I did like to write and I loved words. I hated English composition. God, what a bore, writing all those papers on books, especially Thomas Hardy and Tess of the Dubervilles and all that kind of garbage. But I loved language. And I loved the way you could put words in order, particular orders, to evoke emotions. That always fascinated me. But it didn't work out, so I went into library science and pushed on ahead with life. Um, anyway, Stephanie said, I don't want to live in, you know, I don't want to spend the rest of my... And she had been doing a lot of soul searching in those four years, too. You know, she stayed working as a dental assistant for, I don't know, six months, another year, and decided that really wasn't what she wanted to do all day. She was having trouble because a dental assistant stands all day half bent over with their fingers in somebody's mouth or handing instruments to, you know, and, then, and she was, you know, this is painful, this is a painful job. So she went through a, a period, because I was making such good money all of a sudden, she started looking at, you know, working in the health food store for a while, making minimum wage or just barely less than minimum wage, two or three days a week working in a, in a, um, a uh, landscaping, a garden center, working with plants, trying to find, you know, because she knew she wasn't happy in the marriage. She knew she always wanted to have a college education, but had never done but one or two semesters down at Southeastern Missouri University, I think, in Springfield. And um, so she was a little lost in her life. And I was tired of the drive in the winters. They were really hard. They were really hard on me. Because I didn't get any slack. And that was another thing. I felt like every day that I went to work, or every day that I got up, I had to always prove that I could do just as well as an able-bodied person, or better, so that people wouldn't look at me and say, he has his job because he's a quota filler. Because at the time, ADA had just been passed in 80, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and there was a lot of bitter sentiment in the workforce at the time about quotas, and all of a sudden, here's another sub-minority of people that we have to... And a lot of people looked at me that way and said, well, that's how you got your job, you know. So I always felt every single day I had to prove that I had every right to be there and knew what I was doing and could give back more than they expected from the position. Once again, I realized I was hitting a glass ceiling. I knew that I was worth more than, because of the skills with the computers, I knew I was worth more than what I was being paid as a librarian, as a reference librarian. Stephanie said she wanted to move, and you know, we were like, well, where? And well, we both had always wanted to live by the ocean. We both loved the ocean. And I said, well, California, the ocean is all down a big cliff. I said, so it's got to be the East Coast, you know, where the ocean comes up to land and not falls off. And uh, we got a map out one day and started looking at the cities that were along the eastern coast. And we didn't want to be above the parallel of St. Louis because of the winters. So we started looking at the cities lower, starting with like Myrtle Beach, 
we didn't even consider North Carolina. And I was like, no, nah, Myrtle Beach is, you know, it's a resort town, and I don't want to live in a resort town. And started looking at Charleston. What I really wanted was Savannah. But it, there were no positions. There weren't enough libraries to make it viable to move to that area. And we thought anything more south of Savannah was just a little too far south for us. And we didn't want to go any further than Myrtle Beach, so right in between the two of them is Charleston. So I started doing an online searches for jobs, library jobs, in Charleston County. And I started, and I found three, but they weren't in Char with Charleston County Library. They were with Somerville, Monk's Corner, which were the outlying bedroom communities. And uh, so, you know, I sent my resumes off, and I, Charleston sent me a reject, Monk's Corner sent a reject. Somerville said, we'd like to interview you. And I said, okay, just like that. I said, when? And they gave me a date. I got off the phone with Stephanie and I said, we have to drive to South Carolina. We have to drive to Charleston. And we'd never gone anywhere before, except, you know, St. Louis or Kansas City or, you know, nearby areas. So we drove down here. My interview was on a Monday. We drove down on Saturday, got here late, late Saturday night, or Sunday night, I think it was. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was the other way around. The interview was set for a Friday. So we drove down on Thursday and got in very late Thursday night. And Friday morning, Stephanie, I was driving then. And we drove over to the library and she just, she likes libraries too, always loved books. So she just went and found herself a bench and got a book and I went in for my interview and, you know, same thing, three hours, three different people, I was in there forever. I never, I came out of there going, who knows stuff, I don't know. I said, but we're here. I said, and if we don't come back, let's at least go down to Charleston and rent, you know, a hotel room right on the beach and stay a night because we were planning on just driving right back. So we went, we went down to Folly Beach, and they've got a Holiday Inn. All the rooms face the beach, the, the ocean, and we didn't want to leave. So we stayed another night, and then made the drive home. You know, stopped at a couple seafood restaurants and had a little fun, but then we just basically drove back home. And that was probably around early spring of 98. So, you know, I've been working at the Jefferson City for four and a half years. Well, I wasn't going to keep working at, in Jefferson City unless we moved closer because the 60 mile an hour a day job was killing me, the drive part of it. So we were looking at moving to a, a anywhere between Columbia and Jefferson City that would get me closer. Ash, there was a little town called Asheville that was halfway between Columbia and Jeff City, so that would have made it a 15 minute drive. So we were looking at houses there. At the same time, keeping in the back of our minds, we haven't heard about this interview yet. Mm -hmm. And if, so at the same time we were looking at houses and doing real estate searches in our own area, I was doing them online in this area, in South Carolina, in case that call came. We finally found a house, and in the meantime, we were trying to sell our house. Mm -hmm. Back up a little bit. The first winter we were in our home, it got so cold with, a, with an ice storm that came through that for three days, it was below zero. And with the wind blowing as hard as it was, the wind chill factor was hovering around minus 30. And we were in this old, ill, insulated home. Anyway, one night, Stephanie walked into the bedroom, and right as she walked in, 
the ceiling went kaboom and a pipe burst and water just came out everywhere and what do we do what do we do and I'm like you have to go down in the basement and find the water cutoff valve and the whole bedroom was soaked the heat couldn't keep up with the house because it was so cold we eventually locked ourselves into one room and tucked towels under the, all the door openings closed all the doors to the room and had a space heater in there and were you know electric blankets it's 33 you know inside the house it's 40 50 that's the best that he could get it to it was frigid because of that though it was homeowners came in and the guy looked up he looked down and stepped on the floor and it was a little squishy and he went they remodeled the entire downstairs all new ceilings all new wood floors redid the whole bathroom redid the, because water had damaged at the bed the TV everything was replaced so when we sold the house instead of it being forty thousand dollars when we bought it it was suddenly worth 75 so when we sold it we doubled our money almost anyway we were planning on selling that house and we had gotten a contract on it the next day we found a house in Asheville and signed a contract on it and made an offer on it with a contingency that we were still waiting to hear about this interview so if the interview came through there was a possibility if we chose to go that we would be let out of that contract and we worded it in the offer that way the offer was accepted so we started moving we started packing things up because I still hadn't got the call from South Carolina so we figured okay we're not gonna get out of Columbia very far or Missouri but at least I'll be closer to the job that brings the biggest income in and you know we got friends and we rented a truck and we went to a storage unit in Asheville where the house was we were gonna buy and we started putting all of our stuff in the storage unit because we had to sell our house on a certain date coordinate that with the new house mm -hmm. and we can't we couldn't have everything just waiting around to be moved all in one day so we had put everything in storage and I remember making the last trip to the storage unit and of course I'm driving my van and to make more room in the van we would take my wheelchair out so all I was was the driver and then it would get packed up by Stephanie or friends and I drive we drive 15 miles to Asheville and she would do all the unloading or whoever what friend was with us this particular day it was just me and her and it was the very last of the things to put in storage the very last things and when I had gotten my new van they started coming out with cell phones the big bag ones yeah. and because of my condition and the possibility of needing an emergency call I had one installed in my van in the ceiling so that I could just reach up and press speaker or you know if I was at a stop sign I could it was hard pushing buttons up but I could also pull the handset down and you know but that's where its holder was anyway we're sitting there I'm sitting there waiting and she finally gets everything out I hear the door she's pulling the door down she snaps the padlock closed and as soon as I heard her snap it closed my phone rang and I pulled it off its hook and went hello is this Terry Krupe I said yes it is this is so-and-so the director of the Somerville the Dorchester County Library System and we'd like to offer you a position as our new automa automated technology librarian slash reference librarian and I went can you hold on a moment please and he said yes and I 
hit mute. Stephanie was still, you know, she's coming back into the van. She opens the door and I said, Somerville's on the phone. They want to know if, we want, if I want the job down there. And she went, are you kidding me? <laughs> I said, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go or not? And she said, yes. So I hit mute and I said, I'll take the job. How soon do you want us there? I said, logistically, the earliest I can be there is this, you know, this was like mid-July. So the earliest I can be there is I'll start on right after Labor Day in September. I said, because we've got to move, we've got to find a house. And they weren't picking up any expenses. You know, it was a county system. It wasn't a private company or anything. What's funny is we had sold our house. We got out of the contract on the other one that we were going to buy and we rented a condo for the few weeks that we were going to need to logistically get everything together and head down there. And we got a big U-Haul truck and we got all my, you know, my friends helped and we got it all loaded up and we put a tow hitch on the back for Stephanie's car. We said goodbye to everybody one morning when my van was packed up and she drove the truck and I drove my van in a little caravan all the way down to South Carolina, which was murder on me because the woman can't drive more than three or four hours without a nap. <laughs> and we had walkie talkies so that we could, you know, talk to each other the whole trip. And I keep getting, I'm tired, I gotta pull over. And I'm like, come on, you can push it. No. Come on, another half hour, there's a rest stop, you know, 30 miles up. Let's just not pull over on the side of the road. And then I look in my rear view mirror and see the, the truck go, Stephanie, Stephanie, wake up, wake up. I told you, I'm tired, I've got to pull over. All right, we're pulling over. Driving puts her to sleep. Not to mention that it's this big truck with this droning engine and... This is good, we're right at the end of this tape.